before I dive in, there's uh, one of the reasons I'm excited about this is because part of uh, I've always wanted to be a scientist. That was my my dream as a kid, and then life took over, so I'm I'm became a computer person. Um, but I get to work with scientists all the time now, and I met Dr. Tom Levy, who is the uh, the main PI on this whole thing, a few years ago when when the library was invited to the table to work on research data things. And uh, he had this whole concept called cyber archaeology, which is really pretty cool, because archaeology is a destructive science. Um, you, you have to tear a place down or dig into a place to get things out of it. When you're done, basically, you're left with a hole. It's very hard to document that hole after the fact. So they do a bunch of work on uh, documenting things in 3D, um, and we get to work with them on that. And one of the things that we wanted to do was be able to show this content within the library. And so this, uh, they got a grant from, called a Catalyst Grant from UC, uh, UCOP, um, UC Office of the President, for $1.07 million to do a bunch of stuff uh, to make that happen. And uh, it was meant to leverage that we have a Pacific, Pacific research um, platform, a big network um, to 10 to 100 uh, gigabit that goes up and down California and to curate and uh, analyze and visualize a bunch of 3D data about these sites, um, from usually from the Middle East. Oh, I'm one slide behind, sorry. That, and there's a, there's a map. Um, so th these are the different kind of places that they work on. If you've heard of Dr. Levy's work at all, he's, he's got some PBS specials on um, early uh, metal making and metal, metallurgy in, the, in this, this region of the world. It's really, really cool. Um, so the goals for this, this grant were to capture at-risk cultural heritage uh, sites and objects. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now. Things are disappearing, and uh, uh, they want to be able to make sure that doesn't get lost forever. They wanted to basically get that content and deliver it in 3D. Part of the whole uh, preservation of, well, their kind of preservation of the site and of the dig was to take three-dimensional um, scans and, uh, and pictures and things of the whole thing. But that's pretty complex data, and we want to be able to show that and make it uh, accessible for people for dissemination. Um, we work with four different UC campuses, Diego, San Diego, Merced, Berkeley, and UCLA. Um, we also wanted to be able to create output from this that created uh, virtual reality things that be, could be used by people on their personal devices, so Oculus Rifts, HTC Vives, um, and even the cardboard, so the Google Cardboard and whatever else comes out from there. There's part of the grant that works on a, a product called terrawatchers.org that um, I'll show you a little bit in a second here, that, that watches for things for pollution, um, bombardment, looting, that sort of stuff. And then, like I said, we want to make use of that big Pacific Rim network. And then it's one of the signature, signature products for the Cyber Archaeology Lab and a, um, a group we have at campus called the Qualcomm Institute. It used to be called Cal IT2. Terra Watchers is a site anybody can log on to. It's um, a crowdsourced watch the world's um, sensitive or, uh, or under at risk places to see what's happening. And you can look in, uh, once you log in, it'll show you, it'll give you a whole tutorial. This is a, um, an example of looting. So this is, you kind of look at a spot where there's this probably a, a burial site um, or an old uh, archaeological site that's been looted pretty badly and you can watch for things like this to happen. You can, they have, they have a whole site, a whole list of things you can watch for like gun emplacements and, and things like that. It's pretty interesting. So that's part of the grant. Um, this is the big network I was talking about. I know CNI loves big network, so I had to get a slide of that. Um, these are the collaborators from the four campuses. Um, there's a project manager named Margie Burton who kind of keeps us all organized. Um, Tom DeFonte is a project advisor. He does most of the tech or manages, leads the tech for these caves. Uh, the payoff on this thing is I have a movie at the end of this that shows a lot of pictures of the caves and how it works and things, so most of this is exploratory and we'll get to that at the end. Um, we have a, a fairly decent sized library contingent as well too. The AUL for user services, Catherine Friedman, is on the team and um, makes as many meetings as she can, as does uh, Ho Jung. Uh, you, who is the uh, research data curator, I go, and then Scott McAvoy, who runs the um, digital media lab and also is pretty much the owner of the cave kiosk in the library, uh, making sure that it works. Um, these are the researchers. All of the software, all of the, uh, the work, the, the UI work is done by undergraduates, which is really cool. Um, so we get to work with them and hear how they're going through at the meetings, and then um, there are graduate students who kind of do some of the, the tech stuff and some of the uh, transport stuff in the background. Um, it's funny, we, we normally have that earwig chart for, for data lifecycle. This is the cyber archaeology version of that. 
Um, and it follows a lot of our same beliefs. They go out in the field, acquire things, uh, they curate it, analyze it, and then disseminate it. And I've put a couple places in here where the library ties in here. The metadata management and uh, data uh, staging and storage up in the top right in curation were involved there. Then in dissemination, I'll show you the flow on this in just a little bit. The, um, uh, we use our library digital asset management system to hold a lot of that stuff and to make it available for um, preservation and for access. So this is just one of the sites that's out there that they go and do things at. This, I believe, is it Petra? Um, you can see the balloon and they have cameras tied to the balloon and they basically just walk it back and forth and take a bunch of pictures. And they take those pictures and put them through an algorithm called Structure for Motion, SFM, which then creates a really neat 3D model Let's see if I'm smart enough to make this run. Boom. Go. Aw. Space. Damn it. <laughs> this is the 3D model of, the, uh, of it itself. What am I doing wrong? It's a point cloud. Um, so this, this, the first one was structure for motion with the balloon. This is then used, they also use LIDAR to look at things like the actual, uh, uh, the whole cliffs themselves, and then some of the altars too as well. This is another movie which doesn't seem, it says playing video. Oh, it doesn't play for me. Oh, sorry folks. <laughs> On my screen it's just sitting there statically. Well, let me go back to the one before then. Let me go to this one. Oh, thank you. The only one I always helps. So that's actually doing something? Oh, cool. So not only is it just pictures and, and a pretty um, view of the whole thing, this is now a mathematical model. This is now something that can be worked on and measurements can be made in real, in real, with real space and that sort of thing. Um, but I'm not gonna show all of that. And this is an actual altar, um, so more of a uh, specific thing, not moving. Boom, I bet it's moving now. So that's, that's an actual watch, so one of the pieces itself. See how there's gaps and things too? That's because the LiDAR is on a uh, stand, shooting lasers everywhere, getting those points back, so it can't see around things. Um, but it looks a lot like a, like a bad video game. And interestingly enough, I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, this is the data flow. So this is actually pretty interesting um, from the library side and the data curation side because um, you can see that stuff over on you're right, the, uh, the red thing and then the uh, archaeosol field data capture, they go out there. They're out there and they don't have high speed access out in Jordan and, and out when they're dealing, digging in the dirt. Um, so they have all kinds of different mechanisms they use uh, with iPads and, and, and PCs and, and let Macintoshes that are in a, in a tent somewhere that they go back to and put their information in. All their, everything is geo, uh, geo notated. Um, Anyway, so they do other work there, and then they bring it into a couple of systems they have. One's called uh, ArcheoStore, the other one's called ArcField, and um, it eventually makes its way to the Levantine um, hub server, lab server there. All right, put your glasses on, fine, whatever. And <laughs> I'm not so pretty now. Then uh, the, the processing there, it goes into a bigger database called CaveBase, which knits together a lot of the metadata and the pictures, and it renders a bunch of the pictures and does that structure for motion work. This is all happening on their side, on when I say they, the, the researchers. Then this box in the middle, see that PRP server, the blue one? That's that piece that connects into the whole California backbone. The Cumulo server underneath is a really kind of neat thing we have at the library, where we have this big storage system in Isilon for all of our normal production work. The Cumulo server was something we got um, funded from some campus money for staging space and for experiments for how do you get big data into a dams, into, a, uh, into preservation or into um, curation. And this is a shared space we have right there. They're in that box there because they're kind of competing at the moment to see which one has the best performance and which one is working the best for the researchers because we don't know yet. We're still experimenting here. They're using both actually. Um, and our thinking between the two, because the PRP server has a much better high bandwidth connectivity to the other three campuses, the Cumulo is right in the library's, uh, um, right in our world. So when we want to work with the, uh, the data itself and do things, we have it right there. I watch my time. Um, down below, you can see that's the digital asset management system. Things get flowed down into there, and then um, that's where it goes for longer term st storage and for longer term access. The other arrows go, those four um, sequences there in the bottom are the caves at the four different campuses. And up at top, there are um, the UCSD wave and the UCSM wave. There are a couple other caves, um, and these are um, 
basically screen con constructs, but they call it a wave because not only is it just kind of a screen you stand inside, it actually curves over you like this. They have it built so you kind of step into it. It's very, very um, engaging. Um, it's really kind of cool. Um, all the green stuff is the, the things that the software and hardware that I control, hard, software and hardware I control within the library itself, but it works within the ecosystem of everything else there. And that's a lot of what the experimentation for the grant is to figure out how do we work at scale in real time with real data. Um, then also the other caves aren't completely built yet. Um, I think two of them are up right now besides UCSDs, um, but I know they're still working on some of the details there. The grant still has another year left in it. Um, like I was talking about the, our dams at the library, this is uh, when things come to roost there. This is our collection page for one of uh, Levy's um, cave cam um, sets for Luxor, I believe. And anybody can come in and take a look at this. This is a list of the objects within the Luxor collection. This is what we got originally as a schematic for what, when I said, what do you want us to build in the library? What's it gonna look like? And this was the original picture we got here. And what it is, it's, it's six on their, on their, on their um, end screens. So one, two, three, one, two, three. Well, they're 50 some inches. They're 3D HD TVs, which are kind of getting harder to find, which is <laughs> kind of scary, uh, run by one big computer that knits them all together. Even the 3D is knit together pretty well with that. And we made it stand up as opposed to sit down so that it was a bit more um, kiosky and a little bit more traffic could work a little bit better with people. It's got a sweet spot, which I'll show you here in a minute. You'll see when people look at it. So it's really not meant for huge um, crowds to take a look at it in 3D. In 2D, it does actually very well. You can see it from way in the back of the library and I've got a shot of that in just a little bit. In November, um, we actually unveiled this um, at the library and this is you know, a picture of, of basically what it looks like here and we did an article on that. And I have a video with audio here. Today, here at the Geisel Library, we've inaugurated this uh, immersive 3D environment called a cave kiosk. And this is really great for public outreach. And um, this is a game changer in many respects because we could put this um, device in a museum or a library where you have lots of traffic and people are going to experience world heritage sites around the world. So the system is uh, the first of its kind that we hope will... Sir, that's Jürgen Schultz. He, he's another professor on another PI on the, on the um, project, and he's done a lot of the tech and working as closely with the undergraduates and grad students on some of that, that those back-end systems I showed you before it gets actually to the caves. We'll see many of What we have here is six 4K displays that have eight megapixels each, and they're put on edge so that we can stack them up and we have a way of uh, curving the screen around the viewer. Yeah. And um, these screens are also 3D, so they can do, um, they're like 3D TVs, except that we put six of them together in an array, and we run them all with one computer that's hooked up to all six of them, and generates the images for all these displays. And with that one computer, we can synchronize the imagery so that it looks like the image is all one big image that's just stretched across all these six displays. This project, which is really student-centered, it involves the undergraduates who've been doing the programming, and those are actually oh, darn it. those are actually the kids who do the work. They're really cool. It's really fun working with them. I have to requeue this. Rub oh. how do I move it forward? You got the idea. It's a, <laughs> it's a pretty. Did you see also when it was in 2D from from they did the long shot? It actually grabs the attention nicely from across the library. Um, sorry, I hit the space bar instead of that. I don't know how to set it back up again. Um, but it, you got the idea, basically, Gilly, of the thing. So that's kind of the, the, the all the uh, interesting stuff about that as far as uh, aspirational, where it's supposed to go. That actually works. It's physically there and working. The um, stuff I talked about in this diagram, where we feed the other campuses, um, note that he said that there's one computer running those six computers there. So that's those, that 
display is not pulling from the dams in real time right now. It's got a pretty much its own big strong computer there with a lot of video stuff running in those six, six, six screens. So one of the things we want to experiment with over this next year is maybe we can start eliminating that local device and make it just an output somehow or a very small computer that pulls real time from the dams. Maybe not, maybe that's gonna to be too much of a load but we'd like to know, we'd like to know what, what, what might happen there. Another interesting thing about this device, especially in a library and especially in a space that's 24 five most of the time, We'll come back in the morning and see how they're, they're nicely, those, those angles. Those angles are off just a little bit. The 3D doesn't work very well. Um, and then we had to call in Jurgen and his staff to come in and kind of realign it for us and do different things for us to uh, make some sense out of it. And eventually we got a little template so we could put it there. Overnight, the kids tend to touch stuff. <laughs> and they'll kind of, we don't know what's, maybe it's a cleaning staff. We haven't quite gotten a good answer on this yet. Um, and we're not totally, locked down on exactly the footprint where it's gonna sit in the library, so we haven't you know, nailed it down totally, um, but that's been sort of interesting uh, as well too. Something we thought we learned with these, these screens, they're all granite LEDs, they burn in. Remember that from CRTs? They actually burn in over time. It, it, was, it kind of boggled us, because we had a nice UI people could walk up to and pick the stuff. And you turn them off, or don't turn them off, actually they moved into another thing and, and another, another view and you could still, see, anyway, it was burned in, that's what I'm saying. Um, but they unburn in. You can, you can do things to them that unburn them in, um, but it was sort of a surprise to us and we've had to do some software um, uh, re-engineering to get the, uh, the, the thing to move around a little bit, the, the static um, UI space, the, uh, the, the walk-up space. So that was really interesting. Um, we thought we'd have tons of problem with the, um, the glasses walking away. They're about $25 or $30 for the glasses because they're the uh, rectilinear um, anyway, they're, they're, they're static glasses, but they're, they still cost a couple of bucks. No problem with that at all, getting those distributed. No one's had much problem with that. They're pretty close to the digital media lab, so people feel like they're kind of being watched, I think, at least during the day. Um, I'm trying to think of other things that came up with it. But other things are just having it in a library space. Um, there's, you have to think about what's behind it. So we put a big melamine wall behind it um, so that we could post information about the Cyber Archaeology Project and, and the, uh, the Catalyst Grant itself. So that was pretty interesting. Um, but it does, it is kind of weird how much it drifts during the week. <laughs> and we're not totally sure why. Thanks, sorry I talked so fast. <laughs>